Hi everyone, my name is Audrey and I am a designer for Studio at Shaper and I'm here to give you a little intro to Studio. Studio is our new design tool that we're really excited about and the goal of Studio is to make digital fabrication easier for anyone and everyone and a big part of that is making it accessible so what we did is we put Studio on the web First step to this video is getting to Studio, and so with any device that is connected to the internet, you can go to your browser and navigate to studio.shapertools.com, and then you'll be prompted to log in. If you have an origin, then you already have a Shaper account. This is the account that you use to log into Shaper Hub, so you could log in with that. If you aren't an origin owner or you're new and you don't have a Shaper account yet, you can create one from here. And I already have one, so I'm going to be logging in with my account so that we can go through this project together. So when you're done signing in, Studio will open and it'll either open a new design that it's created for you, it's this untitled one up here, or it will open the latest workspace that you were working on. So here we have a new design and I just wanted to take a quick second to look over some of the things that you can see on screen. You can see the name, you can see that you could rename it by clicking here. You can see this logo here is the main menu. You can look at some of the options in here. We've got sort of the options that are related to the specific file and then some links to other places we might want to go to around in Shaper. And then over here on the left, we have what we call our design palette. So we've got four tools here, find art, make shape, add text, and file import. And then over here on the top right, we have these three words, design, plan, review. Uh, and this is what we call the mode selector. So these are three different modes that you might be in. Actually for design and plan mode, there's a little menu that lets you change some settings. We'll talk about position in a little bit. And then also lets you change the units that you prefer to be in. Down here on the bottom right, we have our help menu. Uh, and this is just a place where we've put together some links that you might be interested in while you're designing. Uh, maybe you've forgotten some of the shortcuts that we'll go over in this video, or there's some that I haven't mentioned. Maybe you just want to look at this video again or others that we'll end up creating. There's a help center with some extra documentation. And then you could also go and either contact us directly or talk to other people in the forum for questions or fun conversation. <laughs> If you're looking at your screen right now and it looks a little bit different, uh, like some of these buttons are missing, and that's because I'm logged into a subscribed version of Studio and you might be looking at a free version, which we called Studio Lite. If you want to try out any of the paid features that I'm going to go over in this video, you can open your main menu and click this button to start a free two-week trial. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the differences between Studio Lite and Full Studio, you can head on over to shapertools.com studio. Okay, onto the project. All right, so now that we've taken a look at sort of the basic tools that we can see on screen, I'm gonna introduce you to the project that we're working on today. So I thought I might work on a fun little bowl stand for my cat. This is my cat, Gizmo. She's uh, very cute. I thought it might be nice to make her a little stand where we can put her bowls so that they're off the ground and maybe a little bit more comfortable for her. And this is just a, a little bit of an example of something that I thought was so, sort of along the right lines and I, I think I'll, I'll do my own play on that. So one of the first things you might wanna do in Studio is make a shape. Uh, if you click on the make shape button, you can see that you have these options for different types of shapes you can make. You could make a circle, ellipse, rectangle, rounded rectangle, and polygon. And as a tip, polygon actually includes all kinds of polygons, and this is where you would make a triangle if you go to the parameter panel on the right and set the number of sides to three. Now you've got a triangle. So that's just a quick, quick tip. That's where you find triangles. I actually want to make a circle so that I can have circles for the bowls to go into for, for the pet bowl that we're making. So I'm going to delete this and I can delete this a few different ways. There's some buttons down here and these buttons are the contextual buttons. So you can see I've got three, three options, shape shifter, which we'll talk about later, duplicate and delete. So duplicate is pretty self-explanatory. It'll make a copy and delete is also pretty self-explanatory. If I undo that action, which I can do up here on the top left, undo, then I could also show you that I can delete things with the delete key. There we go. Another way to undo is to use control or command Z. There we go. 
I'm gonna delete that again, <laughs> poor triangle. Okay, so now we're gonna make some circles finally to be the bowls in our pet stand. Uh, so I'm gonna take this circle and I'm gonna make it the same diameter as the bowl right under the rim, which is four and a half inches. And I can use my scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And then I can make a second bowl for the water bowl next to it by duplicating. I can either hit this button down here, this says duplicate one object, or I can also do a uh, command D. So I'm gonna hit the button because I think that's more clear. And then I want these two circles to be in line with each other. And then I think maybe about an inch apart from each other. So right now it's a little bit unclear how to do that, but there's a few things to keep an eye out for. So the first one is as I'm moving this around, you can see that there's some guidelines that appear to help let me know that these are aligned to each other. And the place where that's set is in the mode menu at the top right. You can tell that this smart alignment feature is turned on. If I turn it off, then there's no guides. And if I turn it back on, the guides are there again. And then we can also see that there's this position feature. So if I turn the position feature on, I get a grid and I can set the size of the grid and I can also set whether or not my objects are gonna to snap to the grid and I can turn this show position labels on and off. So let's talk about what each of these mean. Show grid is pretty self-explanatory here. I can change this to half an inch, for example, and then snap to grid. If I turn that off, then it's like it was before and all I see are the alignment guides for the object. If I turn snap to grid on, then I can move this object around and it's going to give me some dashed gui guidelines to let me know when I'm actually snapping to the grid features. And then position labels are these, these guys over here that are letting us know what the X, Y position are of the object. You'll notice that they are referencing this square dot and this dot here is actually the active anchor. And you can change this dot's position and the object using this button down here. So in the parameter panel, if I click on anchor, I can change the active anchor for this object from the center, which is the default to, let's say, the bottom left. And now that it's the bottom left, I'm getting numbers for the position of this object if I reference it from the bottom left. An important thing to keep in mind about active anchors is that in addition to being where position is referenced, they also serve as a sort of passive constraint. It's as if you've put a pin in your object at that point. If you rotate the object, which you can do by hovering over the outside corner, it's going to rotate about that active anchor. And if you try to resize it, it's also going to resize the object without the anchor moving its position. I'm gonna undo all these things because I had a very specific size. And that can be really useful for positioning objects relative to each other or relative to a grid. So in this case, I can, for example, do the same thing to this circle. I can change the anchor so that it's at the bottom left and I can set this circle to be at zero, zero. And then I can move this object over here and I know that my first object was four and a half inches wide. And so if I want it to be, let's say an inch away from that, I can set it to be at five and a half inches on the x-axis. Another thing to note is that um, you can also type in the position information in the parameter panel. In general, uh, you should be able to move and edit objects inside of the canvas, but if you have something really precise or a specific number that you're going for, it's always nice to put it into the parameter panel because it's a little bit easier to hit that mark than it is sometimes with just dragging things around. Something I should mention is that in order to get around this canvas, I am holding and dragging. I'm clicking and dragging to pan around. And I can also use the scroll wheel to zoom in and zoom out. If you have a trackpad, you can do a two finger pinch to zoom in and zoom out. And then for moving these objects around, I'm also clicking the objects to select them and I'm just clicking and dragging to move them around. So now that I have this, these two bowls positioned where I want them to be, I'm going to work on creating the rest of the shape that is this pet bowl stand. And I have this, uh, this fun idea for something that I can do with some, some tenons that are uh, a little bit cute 
and pet theme that, that I think I can do because of Studio and because of Origin. So one of the great features of Studio is this find art. So if I click on find art, I can actually type in a search term that I'm interested in. In this case, I'm looking for a paw. Uh, and I get a bunch of options of different types of paws that match the search term that I might be interested in. I'm looking for something where there's actually a little bit of space between the pads. So I think this is a good option for me. So if I click this paw, it'll get added to my canvas. And now that it's here, I can put it in one of the corners where I think I'm gonna put a leg and this is gonna be the tenon. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger because the features are small. I think I'm gonna make it an inch and a half because I have dowels that are that size. So there we go. And then also I'm gonna have one on each four corners and I want them to be rotated a bit so that they all look a little bit different. I'm gonna rotate it at a 45 and I'm gonna put it in the corner, okay? And then actually, like I said, I want, I want four of these. So I'm going to duplicate this. I'm gonna pull it over here and I will actually rotate it the opposite direction. So negative 45 degrees. And then I'm going to grab both of these shapes. Aha, how did I grab them both? So here's a tip, if you have a shape selected, you can hold down the shift key and then select another shape and that will add that shape to your selection. Something else that you can do is you can hold the shift key down when you have nothing selected. Notice the little plus that shows up next to your cursor. And then if you click and drag, you'll make a selection box that will select anything in its path. You don't have a shift key on mobile, so another way to get into that multi-select box mode is to hold down your mouse, or in that case, hold down your finger on the screen, and then drag to make a multi-selection. So now I can select both of these objects and make a copy, bring them to the bottom, and actually think I wanna rotate these so that they're sort of upside down. And now we have all of our tenons that are gonna stick through, but through what? So now we have to make an object that all of this lives in. I'm going to duplicate this circle here, and then I sort of wanna see what it looks like to have something all the way around here. So I'm gonna change the anchor point to the center, and I'll scale this a little bit bigger. I think I wanna have at least an inch around the bowls. So I'm going to make this actually six and a half. And I can duplicate this in the other side. And I'm using my snaps to make sure I'm actually aligned to everything. This is actually helping me see that these paws on the bottom aren't quite in the same position as the ones on the top. So I'm gonna pull this down a little bit and now I'm going to make some space around the paws that I'm gonna cut into. So here's a circle. I'm also gonna line this up with the paw and I'm gonna resize it. I'm gonna use the same circle around each paw. And then now I can make selection of all these circles, which are essentially the material that I want to keep. And then I can open Shapeshifter. And it brings me to this view where I can sort of see different parts of all these objects. What Shapeshifter does is it basically takes all the objects that you've brought into it and chops it up and gives you the option to then create any shape from all those chopped up little shapes. So for example, I could create just this little shape between these two circles here by selecting it. In this case, I want everything. So I could either go, go ahead and click everything here, or I can also just click this select all and say make shape. And it's made this fun, very bubbly shape for the bull stand. I actually think maybe this is a little too bubbly and I wanna put Gizmo's name up here. So I might also add a rectangle in here so I'm gonna undo, undo that. 
and I'm going to bring in a rectangle and I can put it in the center of everything. There we go. And we know this is six and a half tall. So if I select all of these shapes, and I click Shapeshifter. I can select everything that I want to keep, which is a fun clicking game. And then I can say Make Shape. Uh, and now I've got this really fun shape here. Something else that I should point out is in the Shapeshifter mode, you can see, you might have noticed there was a Keep Existing Shapes toggle. So just to show you what that means, if I click on these two circles and I hit Shapeshifter, and I maybe want to keep this shape in the center, but for some reason I want to keep the geometry that I used to make the shape. I can toggle on that Keep Existing Shapes button, and then when I say Make Shape, it'll give me the new shape-shifted shape in the middle, but I also still have the information that I had before going into Shapeshifter. I can delete these. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to do with this bowl is I want to put Gizmo's name on it. So here we go. I'm going to write gizmo. And I'm going to put it at the top in the middle. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. And I can actually choose a different font. So in here, I might be interested in something kind of big and blocky like this. Maybe something else handwritten that feels cute, but maybe a little bit too to kid-like, so I'll go down a little bit further. This is a font that I actually really like for this, so I'm happy with, with this font. Now I think I'm pretty much ready to encode all the cut information into this file, so I can go over to plan mode. And you'll notice that when I went into plan mode, I had nothing selected, so it selected everything for me, which sort of gives me an opportunity to set a global setting if I wanted to, so maybe I know that I'm going to be doing a lot of inside cuts with a large router bit, so I'll set them to inside and a quarter inch. And then I can go ahead and set some, some of these paths different if I know that they're not going to be that. So one thing to keep in mind in plan mode is you also have some settings here, and the setting you can see is cut path display. If you turn on this setting, it just means that always going to see the cut path preview. I'll keep that off just for simplicity's sake. I'm going to click on this sort of shape for the entire stand, and I'm actually going to set this to a cut type of outside. And then I think the text is not quite what I wanted. I think it's not getting cut out, so I'm going to select the text and probably what happened is that my bit, my quarter inch bit that I set is too large. So maybe I'll set this to a smaller bit size. I'll, I'll set it to an eighth. So now you can see one of the issues is that the O isn't getting treated as a single shape and that's just because text being the way it is sometimes it's not the same way as a compound shape. So I can go back to design mode and I can fix this really easily by grabbing the text and going into shapeshifter and getting rid of the inside of this O essentially. So the easiest way actually is just to say select all and then click to toggle off this inside of the O. Say make shape and now it should be all fixed. If I go into plan mode, then I can set this to be an inside cut and, and I can see what this design looks like in review mode. Okay, pretty exciting. It's really close. The text is a little bit too rounded and review mode is making it really easy for me to see that. So I can go back to plan mode and I can select just the text. and I can set it to a much smaller bit size, like a 16th of an inch. And now if I go to review mode, we should see that it looks nicer, but actually I think I want that to be a pocket and not, not an inside cut. Let's make it a pocket. 
Okay, there we go. If you wanted to, you can also set your depths in here. So I think this is gonna be a half inch material roughly. So set this to half an inch. These inside bowl cuts are also gonna be through cuts. So they're gonna be half an inch. And actually pretty much everything except for the text is gonna be half an inch. So I can set it all to be a half inch. Uh, and then we'll set a final depth for our pocket cuts for the text. We won't cut that very deep, so I can actually just use these plus minus buttons and I'll set it to 0.1. And now we can take a look at what this looks like in review mode again. So there we go. That is our finished putt bowl stand top and the legs will just be cutting out the tenons on top of some very large dowels. Uh, now that I'm done with my design, I can actually give it a better name than Untitled 01. So I'll call it Gizmo's Stand. And you'd think that this is the same as saving, but actually this has been saving in the background the whole time. So you'll notice in the main menu there isn't a button here for saving and that's because files in studio uh, are just saving as you go and where are they saving to they are saving to your files area so my files is a bit of a new area for your cheaper account it's a little bit like origin files but with slightly more <laughs> features so you can see here I've got all these different folders and files and I can also filter them for different types of files and there's a spot where my premium files are kept but you can also take your files and, and organize them in here and all of these files are sort of automatically connected to your origin. So now that I'm done with my special stand for Gizmo, I know that I can turn on origin and I will actually find this file there ready to use. Okay, one of the last features that I didn't get to go over with for this project is actually this import feature. So I'll just show you a quick example of what that might, might be nice for. Something that I like to do is I like to go over to Shaper Hub and look at some of the projects there. In this case, I'm just looking at projects that we've published here at Shaper, but some of these are actually pretty fun and not too difficult to make. So one of those is like this Viking chair, for example. So if I go to this project, I could say sync to my files. And what that means is that it's going to add that to my files area. And then if I go uh, to studio, I can, let's make a new new design for this. I'll say make a new design. Let's me know we're creating a new design. And then I can go to import. I can say I want to import from my files. And you'll notice that the Viking chair is right here. And here's the SVG for that project. If I say import, then the chair comes in like this and I can say place separately. So place separately will actually just see both of these separate parts and place them as uh, artwork. Place group will just mean that everything is grouped together. So when you select it, it selects everything at once. So I'll say place separately for now. And now I've got the stool in here and I can personalize it. So I could put somebody's name, like my name on the stool if I wanted to, like so. There we go. So that's file import. You can do that with SVGs and DXFs. When you're done with your file, you know that it's going to show up in your files area. So if I go to my files, I'm just gonna refresh this. You'll notice that the Viking chair that we added from Shaper Hub is here and then my stool is here now. And these will be automatically loaded to your origin. If you're someone who doesn't have an origin or if you wanna use Studio for a project that uses a different fabrication tool and you just need the SVG from Studio. You can also, in the menu, you can say download and it will download your project as an SVG. Thanks for watching this introductory walkthrough for Studio. We love to see the projects that people make with our products. So if you make something uh, with Studio or with Origin or even maybe both, make sure you tag that with Shaper Made so we get to see it. 
Uh, you can also uh, post those projects on the community forum. And that's also a great place to ask questions, uh, which are surely to get answered. Um, I'm just really excited to see what people make with Studio. And I'm also really excited to keep working on it, to keep making fabrication easier for more people.